Vivek, you have written a new book, which I want to say has a slightly mysterious cover. And I feel like if I describe your book as a defense of materialism, people are just going to like immediately close the video. So I want to look at the kind of classical Marxist premise, right? That there is an inherent antagonism between the capitalist class and the working class, where of course the former exploits the latter. And because of this conflict and because, you know, workers all share the condition of being exploited, uh, the, the premise is that they'll be driven to collectively fight this this exploitation. Now, of course, in the past, we've seen many instances of this happening, and we've seen many instances of this happening successfully. Um, but at the same time, we haven't overthrown capitalism, you know, there's been no workers revolution. So people thinking about this question has led to something that you call the cultural turn. Maybe talk about the cultural turn and how it kind of came about. Uh, sure. This is a, look. I know it, it sounds like a very um, arcane academic question about the place of culture, this, that, and the other, but it's an intrinsically political question, because essentially what we're asking is, in capitalism, if it is the case that the bosses mistreat, or exploit, and dominate the workers, then there's a ready option for workers, which is to come together, band together, collectively organize, and do something about it. As you were just saying in the preceding um, section of, of this show, uh, Jen. Now, in the first part of the 20th century, that seemed to actually be happening. From 1900 to 19, I'd say 35, 40, Europe and some parts of the global South were rocked by massive social revolutions led by workers and in some cases, peasants as well. It seemed to be the case that capitalism was on its last legs. And so out of that, we got not just the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. We also got social democracy out of that same era with massive labor movements and the parties committed to labor pushing for reform and in some cases pushing for revolution. Well, by the 1950s, it was looking like that era was over. Whereas in 1930, many socialists thought that capitalism was on its last legs. By the 50s, they're asking, well, what happened? Mm -hmm. We thought we were going to bring in socialism, but instead, what we're getting is an incredibly stable and enduring capitalist system. So what gives? Why aren't workers coming together? That's the same question we're asking today. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's an enormous groundswell of opposition to neoliberalism. Ideologically, neoliberalism has lost all legitimacy right now. And that's why we're seeing all this churning happening in the political culture. Unfortunately, most of it favoring the far right. But there is this open declaration on the part of the population, that they won't take this tyranny of the market anymore. And yet, as you said earlier, and as Jan Mac McAlevey was saying, as I try to point out in this book, all the opposition is individualized still. Mm -hmm. it's, on an, it's this great resignation kind of thing. So even today, we're asking the question, well, when and where and how will the vast majority of the population come together and act collectively? Okay, so this question has been around now for 70 years. And it's been the question. Whereas in the first part of the century, Marxists would talk about the material conditions of workers and why they militate against collective organization. And by extension, hence it's kind of reasonable and rational and understandable why workers aren't coming over to unions and to socialists. And that means we have a task ahead of us. By the 1960s, intellectuals are saying something different. It's that the reason they're not coming together is because of the weight of culture. Mm -hmm. of ideology, of indoctrination, of socialization, things like that. And very quickly to this view that workers don't understand their own situation. The problem with them is their consciousness is wrong, their ideology is wrong, etc. And this was at the heart of what's called the cultural turn. This entire intellectual trajectory came to the conclusion that the reason Marxists have not been able to understand why workers haven't revolted or come into collective action, etc., is because Marxists never appreciated the importance of culture. Now, that may or may not be true, but it had one very important implication, which is that intellectuals quickly came to the view that there's no such thing as objective interests, there's no such thing as structural constraints, there's no such thing as the imposing weight of the class structure, and instead, politics is really all about how you look and understand the situation how you come to ideologically look at the situation. So politics becomes all about culture now. Changing politics means changing people's culture. And 
one implication of that was intellectuals understand the situation better than workers do. Mm -hmm. So it fed, and you see it now on the left in this country and elsewhere, there's an enormous condescension towards workers. There's this incredible feeling that they're dupes, they're idiots. What's the matter with Kansas? Why aren't they doing what they're supposed to do? Mm -hmm. They're fooled by Trump. They're taken in by this. They're all taken in by uh, various uh, aspects of culture. But we understand. The intellectuals understand. It's exactly the opposite of what socialists in the first part of the, uh, the 20th century used to think, which is we need to understand their situation. and We need to figure out why it's rational, it's reasonable that, for them to do what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So this became one of the uh, most important consequences of the left's distancing from the working class. Because as you're no longer involved with the class, it's easy to write the script in which the world is clear to you, but it's obscure to them. You understand what's going on, but they're fooled by it. And that makes it impossible to organize them. It just makes it impossible because you go in there treating them like idiots and they'll dismiss you. And this is the political motivation for writing a book on a, an apparently arcane topic like culture and the place of culture and things like that. Well, I want to follow up on that because you're right. I mean, it is very common to hear these days that workers are, um, you know, acting or voting in ways that are not in their interest, right? Like this is the common narrative that we heard after, I don't know, however many elections that, you know. Every election. When, every and, single every election. election. No, you're right. Yeah. I've been when, in this country since 1980. Every single election, the left says, what a bunch of idiots. Right. Why do poor and working class people vote for Republicans who are obviously going to pass anti-worker laws, who are going to strip away the social safety net? Clearly, they're voting against their own interests. Um, I think that you could make a sort of similar argument where if there's a union drive at a company and, you know, uh, workers vote no, as in Bessemer, Alabama, um, these vote these workers, you know, one would say, why did these workers vote against their own interests? So if you reject the idea that these people are dupes or victims of, you know, false consciousness or brainwashing, which clearly you do, um, how do you explain these this, this phenomena? It's a very good question. Um, you, you have to distinguish between two things when it comes to the decisions workers are making. One is their ability to understand their immediate experience of being a worker. They show up at work every day. They're treated like shit by their boss every day. They feel the insecurity of the work. They feel the overwork. They know that their wages are low. No amount of ideology, no amount of socialization, no amount of indoctrination can fool them about that. Mm -hmm. And they're all motivated centrally to do something about this economic foundation of their lives. If you look at the polls of American population, there isn't too much uh, disaggregation by income in the polls, but it's remarkable that amongst the general population, year after year, decade after decade, and they're asked, what's the most important issue in your life? It's economics, it's always economics. And if you stratified it by income, you'd find it even more staggering. And true, I'm sure, I guess one has to say this to the American left, even black and brown people care about it. <laughs> right, right. right? So, yeah, this is true all the time. They know it, okay? There's no fooling them about that. So think of that as your interest, your perception of your immediate surroundings and of your immediate uh, circumstances. Now you wanna do something about that. To do something about that now does require going beyond your immediate experience and thinking about strategies, getting the information around what kind of strategy might help you and information around what kind of policies might be policies from the government that help you, which point you have to rely on others. You have to rely on the media. You have to rely on parties. You have to rely on intellectuals because they come to you and they say, hey, we know you're being screwed. Here's how we can make it better. Now, when they say fight your boss, it'll be better, that they understand. But they also know that there's a wider economy, a wider system, and their individual firm, their individual establishment where they're working is part of that system. And in order to make their factory, their hotel, their restaurant survive and do good enough that they can get higher wages, these, this thing called the economy has to also do better. This thing called government has to also be friendlier. This thing called trade has to also work towards them. And they don't know anything about that. So now they have to get information from the so-called experts. In this, in the struggle for information, of course, when the media is dominated by capital, when intellectuals are slavish to the parties and to the establishment, when politicians are bought over by the corporate community, what they'll be getting in the way of solutions is propaganda. And of course, they're vulnerable to propaganda. 
any of them. They're especially vulnerable to propaganda when there's no institutions of the working class to give them accurate information, the way unions used to do, the way a socialist party might do. Mm-hmm. They, therefore, they're angry about their situation. You can't fool them about that. But they might go and vote for the Republicans because the Republicans say to them, do you know how to make your jobs more secure? Cut taxes. Mm-hmm. You know how to make jobs more secure? Stop uh, immigration. Why wouldn't they be fooled by that? Intellectuals are fooled by it all the time. The right. people who are most credulous towards nonsensical ideologies are intellectuals. Right. And they actually have the, the means to sit and read and assess these arguments. For a person mm-hmm. who's working 12, 16 hours a day, sitting in front of the TV, sees educated people and g- gets this information from them, yeah, of course. They're desperate and they'll try any solution. So there's no mystery there. They are not acting against their interests. They are trying to act for their interest to the best of their ability. And that includes the informational resources that are made available to them. And that's why the propaganda was so important. Yeah, so I I want to ask a kind of similar question, which is that um, in your book, you talk about how a big part of the cultural turn or a big part of the cultural culturalist argument is that workers are sort of actively consenting to their participation in the capitalist system. And um, what's interesting about your book is you you argue that consent does play a role in kind of keeping capitalism like chugging along, so to speak, but that it doesn't function exactly in the way that culturalists uh, claim that it does. So how exactly does this idea of consent work under capitalism? Well, um, when the what's called the new left in the 1950s and 60s was struggling to understand how capitalism stabilized after the war, instead of continuing down the road to its implosion, they came to this idea, as I had said earlier, that it was the working class's socialization, culturalization into the system. You see this in what's called the Frankfurt School. You see this in cultural studies. You see with this very particular understanding of Gramsci that was um, widely in currency at the time. At the heart of it is the notion that what intellectuals, the media, the church, the state manages to do is to make the system seem legitimate Mm -hmm. to the workers and and therefore elicits their consent to the system. So capitalism is surviving because workers are consenting to their place in the system. Now, what I say in the book is, look, consent can be understood in two ways, active consent, passive consent. Active consent is when I see a particular circumstance or situation as intrinsically desirable, I want it. So if my boss offers me a raise, I consent to it because (laughs) why the hell wouldn't I? I, That's why I'm in the job, it's only for the money. I consent to it actively. That's seeking, seeing it as legitimate, desirable, and therefore actively consenting to it. Then there's something that you might call passive consent, which is the boss comes to me and says, listen, I'm going to actually have to cut your wages. Not only can I not get raised, things are really bad, and I'm going to have to ask you to hold off on uh, wage increases, and I might even have to take some away. Why do I consent to it? Because even though it's a horrible situation to be in, the option is I leave the job. And if the situation out there is so bad that there's no other jobs, I'll consent to it. Yeah. But in the same way as I consent to somebody putting a gun to my head and saying, give me your money. Right. This is grudging passive consent. So in my view, what happens in capitalism typically is active consent among the working class is actually quite uh, unusual. Most of them go to their job because they have no other choice. Marx called this the dull compulsion of economic relations. Your economic circumstances compel you to show up to work every day, accept the work every day, and thereby accept your place in the system. Active consent is much more fleeting, much more difficult to acquire, and it's always very partial because even if your wages go up, you're still at the job, you're still being treated like shit, you're still capable of being let go at any time, and quite often the higher wages come at the cost of speed up working harder, working faster. So what they're taking with one hand, so what they're giving you with one hand, they take away from the other. Mm -hmm. Consent, therefore, is always ephemeral. And the left made a big mistake when it thought that the system being stable must be because the workers are consenting. Because then, over the course of the 90s and 2000s, as there wasn't a challenge to neoliberalism, instead of seeing that neoliberalism isn't being challenged, people are dejected, demoralized, beaten into the ground, and don't see an alternative, Instead, there was this view that neoliberal ideology is the shit. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. It's so successful. It's so overwhelming that it absorbed the working class into the system. And that was a big mistake. And once again, what it led to was a condescension towards the class rather than an understanding that every single support that it could have had has been taken away from it. And it's accepting the system because there's no alternative. And that's why when the Sanders alternative came around, you saw overnight the political culture change. Overnight. Yeah. Why? It's because nobody was happy. They just thought right. there's no point in participating. They just thought there's no point in objecting to the system because they'll they'll be screaming in the wilderness. This was the, the, the neoliberal order couldn't have collapsed ideologically as rapidly as it did if it was based on active consent. But on the topic of, you know, this widespread unhappiness and also capitalist stability, um, I, obviously a key part of your book, which I referenced earlier, is um, you, you argue that it, the class structure itself is able to channel worker dissatisfaction into individual forms of resistance rather than collective. Can you uh, unspool that for us a little bit? Because that's really important. Yeah. Uh, the Look, the reason they give grudging consent, I call this resignation. The reason yeah. they resign themselves to the system rather than actively consenting to it is not because they think everything is fair and hunky-dory. It's because even though they hate their jobs and they hate their bosses, it's exactly as you said earlier in the show, Jen, the costs, the risks of trying to organize at the workplace are so massive that unless they feel that there's a reasonable chance of success, unless they feel that the risks will be worth it and pay off at the end, they find it much more reasonable to take the easy way out. And the easy way out, there's two ways to do it. Either you quit your job, like we're seeing now the great with this thing called the great resignation, try mm -hmm. to find a better one. Or what you try to do is resist individually at the job. Historically, the most uh, common form of individual resistance has been absenteeism. Yep. You, just, you just figure out a way of not showing up. More aggressively, you might sabotage or you might drag your feet at work, these sorts of things. You try to do what you can without getting caught. You try to do what you can with the fewest risks. This is all an expression of what Marx correctly said was the inevitable tension and clash and antagonism between workers and their bosses. But it's one that does result in collective action, not because they're fool, but because their very place in the class structure mm -hmm. makes it harder for them and unreasonable for them to organize in most situations. Because it's a consequence of their place and the structure itself, this has a very powerful implication. It means the reason the system is stable isn't because of ideology, it's because the structure underwrites its own reproduction. It's because once capitalism makes it so that everybody has to go out and look for a job, the norm is gonna be that their main priority is holding on to the job, not challenging the job, not challenging the boss, their main priority is going to be holding on to the job. Then the challenge of organizing becomes, okay, how do I make collective action attractive to these workers when I know that they know that their backs are up against the wall and if they lose this job, they'll be worse off than they were even with this unpleasant, shitty job. So the, their place in the structure makes individualized resistance more reasonable, more likely than collective resistance. If that were not the case, the system would have collapsed centuries ago. I, I, okay, so I, I agree that false consciousness is a bad framework, or at least inadequate. Um, that said, I do think it's also too much to say that, like, everybody is secretly just this militant in waiting. And I'm not saying that you're saying that, but I feel like that sentiment kind of crops up from time to time on the left. And yes. I just want to use, like, a sort of concrete example to try to, like, take this apart. So if I went outside right now and I, like, ask my neighbors or just like random people on the street how they felt about capitalism. Like, honestly, it's pretty unlikely that like someone would explicitly say like, well, I hate capitalism a lot, but I can't do anything about it because, you know, the, the class structure inherently deters collective action. Like if you ask most people, they would probably say something like, yeah, I like capitalism or it's fine. And, you know, lots of people, as we know, would say, I love capitalism. Like it, 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 you know, helps me make money. It like gives me these consumer goods. So, you know, like, I guess the question is like, how can we respect and understand individuals stated motivations and actions uh, in the context of these sort of larger systemic patterns that you're talking about? Um, that's exactly the right question. And the 
starting point for understanding, respecting, and allotting them the dignity that they deserve is to treat them as thinking, reasoning people who are aware of their situation and not as dupes who might have been fooled into accepting their situation. Now, now then, of course, if you go out into the street and ask people, what do you think about capitalism? Most of the time they're gonna say, well, I don't know, or they're gonna say, yeah, I think it's fine because right. you're at this moment in this country dealing with the most depoliticized population the world has ever seen. And you know, most people don't think in grand systemic terms. Most people mm -hmm. think in terms of their job, their family, their immediate situation, their cousins, things like that. So the first thing in order to get beyond where we are now is you've got to target your audience. And this is important for the left because the left still now mostly speaks to, to a generic, typically middle-class audience. That's who they're thinking of when they think of their audience because they're so isolated from the actual working class. So now if you say you take the same question and you go into an Amazon warehouse or a McDonald's or a Walmart, you'll get a slightly different response, but you can't go around talking about capitalism. What okay. you've got to say is, you like your jobs? Do you like your bosses? You start with people where their consciousness is. You'll get to the discussion of capitalism way down the road mm -hmm. when they've had collective action, when they see that there's a consistency in the boss's response to what they're trying to do, when, you see, when they see that when they organize, the state also comes down, the intellectuals come down and the media come down on the side of the state, et cetera, they'll see the connections themselves. The way you get there is by first a lot, giving them the dignity, the respect of treating them like people who are thinking and reasoning, talking to them as an organizer to figure out where and, and how you'll find the pressure points in their consciousness and helping them then see that all is not lost, that it's understandable that they're cynical, dejected, et cetera, et cetera. And through slow, steady progress around concrete issues, struggles around concrete issue, build up their confidence in themselves and in their organization where they can start thinking in collective terms and somewhere down the road in systemic terms. But the starting point is to treat them as rational, thinking, reasonable people and to talk to them, not at them. So on that subject, um, another part of your book is looking at the process of class formation, right? And um, something I was thinking of is, you know, sometimes people distinguish between, quote, a class in itself and a class for itself. And I'm wondering if you think that these terms are useful or if, if they help us understand this process of class formation. Yeah, they're essential. They're at, they're, and one of the unfortunate facts about the last 30 years is the, um, the distinction was lost. And intellectuals went to a theory of class, which in which class is all about when people look in a particular way. And until then, there's no class, which is, means you don't have a class here, but you have as a theory of group formation. Anytime you have like-minded people coming together, now you've got a class. Uh, whereas the distinction between class in itself and for itself basically says this, there's people who have certain jobs, they're in the occupational structure, and that occupational structure can be considered at a certain level of abstraction, a certain level of generality as a class structure. What makes it a class structure is that those people's jobs have certain things in common regardless of their understanding of those things being in common. What they have in common is not their, how they're thinking, not their ideology. What they have in common is what they have to do every day to earn a living. That makes it a structural fact, a fact about their place in the structure. And the truth is, outside of fancy intellectuals, everybody thinks this way. Everybody thinks about, I'm Joe Worker, I'm a blue collar worker, I'm just an ordinary person, and there's other people like me in the world. That's how they think about it. The challenge becomes how you take these people who are in a common situation, have broadly similar jobs, face the same risks, have to do the same things to uh, make ends meet, and how you br bring them together as a collective actor, what we've been talking about so far. Mm -hmm. Now, unless you make the distinction between class in itself, that is the class structure, and class for itself, that is class formation, you can't even pose the question of how to organize people. Because if you don't think there's a class structure and you want to organize, who are you organizing? You're just right. randomly going to go out into the street and you pick the Wall Street banker, you pick the fashion model, you pick the grad student, and you pick the worker and you go, hey, let's all make a class. Mm 
Yeah. The reason socialists came to this distinction as in everything else was through hard experience. Mm -hmm. the hard experience was you cannot look at politics as consciousness raising. Right. You can't look at it as a, essentially a cultural act in which you bring people to, together around their values. Because what you see is in the long run, people pursue their interests. Mm -hmm. What values they have will be values orbiting around their interests, but they pursue their interests. We found that out through hard experience. It's intellectuals who are confused about it. So if as socialists, you go, we want to organize, you have to know who is your constituency. And your constituency is generated by your analysis of the world out there, not public opinion polls or focus groups or something like that. Your analysis of the world, what its structure is, and that tells you, here's priorities, regardless of what their immediate consciousness happens to be. That's where I organize. And then you build the consciousness. You know, I have to say, your book is in some ways a bit depressing, uh, or at least sobering, because if the problem is false consciousness, uh, that that's actually kind of easy to solve because the answer is um, more magazines like Jacobin or more YouTube videos or like more philosophy professors or, you know, more like pro worker Marvel movies. Current left, more shaming. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. Or more shaming and more hectoring. And yeah, exactly. Um, but that's not I mean, you obviously argue that's not the case. Um, in fact, the problem lies in the actual structure of capitalism itself. So in many ways, that's like a much bleaker situation because it's much harder to fight against that. So um, I, I'm playing devil's advocate a little bit here. But the, but what I want to ask you is like, why then, given this, given that the deck is so drastically stacked against working working people in this way, why should we still think of the working class as the agent of change? I mean, lots of people have been, you know, challenging that notion, right? I think a really popular one now is to say that uh, the working class can't be an agent of change because white workers are just like too racist to make common cause with, you know, uh, non-white workers. And so we should, we should, you know, put aside the notion of the working class and organize along other lines like racial or ethnic lines. Or, you know, you could even say, uh, why don't we, why don't we organize on the idea of like just a, a more general, like popular front of the people against like the elite? Why do we still care about the working class? It's a defining element of the current left that it has zero knowledge of history. I mean, absolutely none. It boggles the mind. So the immediate response ought to be, can you just give me some examples? Right. Can you just give me some examples? Because I would, man, listen, exactly as you say, Jen, there is a sober realism that comes with the acknowledgement that capitalism structurally makes organizing hard. And it's very attractive and I would love to be able to say, hey, man, let's, let's find some other way to change things. Maybe if we put the right guy in power, the great man theory, maybe if we just stick to our ethnicities, maybe uh, racial solidarity is the way to go. Fine. Just find me any instance where that's brought about progressive change. If you can do that, I'm happy to consider it. The reason we stick with the working class is twofold. One, obviously, as your, the listeners of this show will know, they have a strategic position in the economy that gives them real power against the powers that be. Okay, fine. Perhaps it's just too hard. That might be. Perhaps it's just too hard. And hey, maybe let's uh, settle for second best. As Obama said, let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Let's settle for second best and go for, I don't know, some kind of ethnic movement or um, the enlightened MSNBC watching progressive intellectuals movement. And uh, they can finger wag their way to social justice or, you know, uh, the New York Times and all these people. All right, just find me some instances. You think that maybe, not you, but uh, our imaginary interlocutor, you think uh, ethnic, racial solidarity is fine. Find me where it brought about real change for the vast majority. If you can do that, but here's the thing, you won't because we have a hundred years of nationalist movements. It's like the left does not know that there was an independent struggle in the colonial countries. There were nationalist movements in these countries and in every single one of them, there was a fight as to what the definition of the nation will be, what the nation of the, the definition of political community will be. Will it be defined by the elites the way in this country today, the anti-racist struggle has been defined completely by black and brown elites. Sorry, brown elites. I didn't say, I don't know why I said brown. Brown elites. Um, or will it be, and the way it was in the anti-colonial movements, where in many countries, it was the elites who took over and defined the nation, or will it be 
defined along the needs and the interests of the vast majority, which is working people. You can't sidestep that question. So if you want to go for another, fine. If you want to go for another agent, fine. Just do it with some understanding of where it's led in the past and some, some uh, evidence as to where it's worked in the past. I've put a lot of thought, a lot of energy into this. And the reason I keep coming back to labor is I do not see any other possibility. You looked at the yeah. scorecard. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it's quite amazing to see the left say things like this. And then you say, fine, man, just fine. I mean, you think I'm happy beating my head against the wall, being an <laughs> academic, trying, trying to convince upwardly mobile grad students that Marxism or socialism is meaning? I'd love to join the party. I would love to join the virtue signaling, race baiting <laughs> party and play the, the brown guy all the time. Why do I not? It's because it leads nowhere. Yeah. All right. Well, Vivek, you've been very generous with your time. Um, so I think I'm going to end with just one last question. And I want to come back to the topic of culture, uh, because I think, you know, obviously what your book does very well is sort of interrogate and expose um, the shortcomings of the kind of culturalist explanations. But you also make it really clear in your book that you're not completely dismissing culture. You have nothing against culture. And in fact, you find it useful at times. So I guess the last question for you is, for, for all of us on the left, when is it actually useful for us to think about culture? It's useful all the time. Mm -hmm. um, we can have an analysis of the material and structural obstacles organizing. Understand that when you organize, you've got to show working people that they have a reasonable chance of winning, that what you're asking of them is doable, that there'll be real gains at the end of the day if they join the union or join an organization. These are all material reasons to join, right? Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, they still have to take on the boss and they still have to take all these risks and they might have to go out on strike, which means even with a strike fund, there's gonna be a big, big uh, falling, falling off in their standard of living. There's gonna be real difficulties, which means that on a pure cost benefit analysis, it never makes sense. In the short run, it just doesn't make sense to take on these risks. The reason workers take on the risks is that they also feel a sense of obligation, a sense of moral commitment to their fellow workers to take the risks with them, to undertake the sacrifices with them. And that sense of mutuality, it requires cultural work. It requires building an identity, building some sort of sense of mutual community, which cannot be done simply through a cost benefit calculus. Now, that said, it doesn't mean you can just invent militancy overnight. It doesn't mean, because if you take this culture stuff to an extreme, it leads to an ultra leftism. That if we just exhort right. the workers enough, they'll do whatever they need to do. That's never the case. You're always disciplined by exhorting them and bringing them together, but around achievable ends, which means you're always constrained what's possible. It's a, a material reality. So first of all, you, you cannot organize them without doing this sort of identity formation. But the second point is this, you can't even begin talking to them except through the culture that they already inhabit. Organizing is motivated by concerns for justice. It's the strategic sense comes out of a analysis of the situation that's objective, but the quotidian everyday task of winning people over, talking to them, immersing yourself, in their community is a cultural task. If you talk, if you come and talk to them like some pointy head professor or some policy wonk, but with the culture of our class, they reject you and they will reject you immediately. There is a process of declassing that has to go on amongst middle-class people who are organizing, which is a cultural act. So in order to be able to communicate to working people, you've got to be culturally familiar to them. You've, you can't be patronizing, you can't be paternalistic, you gotta to relate to them as an equal. And all of that has cultural markers, all of that mm -hmm. does. So unless you understand their culture, unless you respect their culture, you can't even begin this stuff. Therefore, the problem with the cultural turn is not that it takes culture seriously. The left socialist invented cultural analysis. The right didn't, the progressives didn't, it was an, invention of the left. If you read Lenin, Trotsky, Luxembourg, so much of their writing 
is about how to bring workers together in the culture that they have. That's the language that you use. The problem is it always has to be disciplined by an appreciation of the material constraints that they're facing. And it has to be enlivened with an understanding of the material benefits that they'll get if they un undertake those risks, if they undertake the struggle. Without culture, you can't do that. But if you lose yourself in culture, you'll, you'll be defeated. All right. Again, Vivek Chibber's new book is The Class Matrix. It's out now from Harvard University Press. <laughs> there is the mysterious cover that I was alluding to earlier. Uh, don't let the cover fool you, by the way. It's an extremely readable um, and and like wonderfully clear book. Um, I really loved it, Vivek. So thank you again for coming on the show. And uh, it was really good to see you. Thanks for having me, Jen. Always a pleasure. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks. Thank you.